Well, good evening, everyone. We want to welcome you back uh, to our conclusion of the study of the judges that we're entitled Breaking Bad. Got my good friend with me here, James German. How are you doing welcome this evening? James. And uh, today we're looking at uh, the last judge. The last judge that we're going to look at is Samson. And uh, this is a judge that most of us are familiar with. Um, there are some Old Testament characters that uh, make Hebrews 11 the chapter of faith, Hebrews 11, um, and they're head scratchers. Um, and uh, Samson is one of those that uh, make uh, the, uh, this uh, incredible chapter of giants um, in the Old Testament, giants in the faith. And here's the, I just want to begin with this passage here. It says, I don't have time. The Hebrew writer says, I do not have time to tell you about Gideon. We studied Gideon, yeah. Barak, Samson, and Jephthah, about David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, and gained what was promised, who shut the mouths of lions, quenched the fury of the flames, and escaped the edge of the sword, whose weaknesses turned, whose weakness turned to strength, who, who became powerful in battle and routed foreign armies. And so I think the, the operative, uh, the key word there that I saw in that passage there is weakness turned to strength. Yeah. I think this is the, uh, the story of, um, of Samson. What would you say his weakness was? His weakness would be pride. Pride, right? I mean, pride, pride is what we're going yeah. to talk about, right? Absolutely. So kind of pride is like the, yeah. the source of almost every spiritual downfall. Pride is a kind of a spiritual cancer that slowly eats away um, at our potential for um, gratitude, contentment, and love. Yeah. So this is a... And you know, George, there's nothing wrong with pride in and of itself. Uh, positive pride can be a good thing. I mean, you know, I'm... I'm proud of my family. I got two grandkids. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm proud of those kids. Whatever they do, if they if they take a coloring sheet and they stay within the lines, man, I'm proud. <laughs> you know, that makes me a proud proud grandparent. Proud to be a student. You know, some some students are really excellent. They try hard. There's nothing wrong with being uh, having pride it's and a good doing side your to pride. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. There's there's definitely a good side good side to being pride. So all pride's not necessarily a bad thing, but sinful pride, I think is when you have an exaggerated feeling of self-importance. You, you begin to think that um, too highly of yourself. And I think that's what the Bible says. It says that, uh, it, that sinful pride is pride that is simply thinking too, too highly, highly of oneself or mm -hmm. thinking too highly of yourself. And tonight in Judges 13, um, we do have, uh, in the Old Testament, we do have a plan A. You can see that, and you can do, and you also see a plan B. Plan A is if everything, if you do what's, what you're supposed to do and everything goes okay according to plan, mm -hmm. plan B is a fallback plan is when you don't do everything just exactly like you should have done it. Uh, and so you, you kind of have a, you have a few do-overs. When, yeah. when you do that. And we've seen this a lot, you know, through the, even the judges, but n um, none more than in the story of Samson. We, we see the plan B, yeah. you know, for Samson. He did not, uh, because of his pride, you know, his pride kind of to ruined him. And and really, the just the uh, the sin of the eyes. I mean, he was oh, uh, someone yeah. that yeah. Um, that had a real problem with, um, with women and... Um, but he was certainly gifted by God. I'm talking about from birth, he's gifted by God. But he has a reputation for being the strongest man on earth. Um, I don't know who you would say is the strongest man on earth right now. I don't know that person. Know. But uh, we look at someone like a Hulk Hogan yeah. type person, mm -hmm. you know, just yeah. um, whether he's really strong or not, I don't know. But, um, you know, there's a, but that's who, that's who Samson is. He has this, you know, this incredible strength. Um, he could kill a lion with his bare hands. He could rip a, you know, a gate off the hinges and, yeah. and carry it up a hill. And he could kill, uh, with, the, with the jawbone, he could kill thousands of Philistines. Yeah. You know? And so that's the kind of power and strength that he had. But it was, uh, it, but it was a gift that was given to him by God. And um, it wasn't his, you know, a strength that, uh, that, uh, that was his alone, but rather it was a supernatural strength that God gave him. Right. And so looking at Judges 13, 2 through 5, kind of get rolling here. A certain man of Zorah named Manoah from the clan of the Danites had a wife who was sterile and remained childless. The angel of the Lord appeared to her and said, You are sterile and childless, but you are going to conceive and have a son. Now see to it that you drink no wine or fermented drink, and that you do not eat anything unclean, because you will conceive and give birth to a son. 
No razor may be used on his head because the boy is to be a Nazarite, set apart to God from birth, and he'll begin the deliverance of Israel from the hands of the Philistines. Yeah, and you know, George, uh, Samson's birth was miraculous from the very first. You know, the angel, there was an angel that appeared to his mother, said, you know, don't eat anything. You know, she, 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 he basically, the angel gave his mother the Nazarite vow, and she had to follow those restrictions before the child, before Samson was even born. And from his birth, Samson was consecrated to God. And it, it, most people probably uh, don't realize, they've heard of Nazarite, uh, Nazarite, but they probably don't know exactly what it is. Uh, with a with a Nazarite, it was usually a temporary position uh, that people, that the old, that the people in the Old Testament would go through, but there were there are instances like Samson. You remember John the Baptist? John the Baptist yeah. was a Nazare Nazarite, but a lifetime Nazarene. Mm. And um, but there were three basic uh, restrictions that if you were to be a Nazarite, that you had to do. One, they had to abstain from ever drinking any wine, and this included even eating any grapes. Uh, I think that was probably because uh, eating, wine, drinking wine, eating grapes was a symbol of kind of luxurious, wealthy living, mm -hmm. and a Nazarite was to kind of abstain from being able to, to from exhibiting those kind of traits. Got it. The second thing was a Nazareth, a Nazarite was not to touch a dead body. It was taboo for him to be. He was consecrated to to God as a life. And um, therefore, God said, "Don't." That was, uh, and that was, uh, that was also, I think, to the other Israelites at that time too. It was kind of taboo for them to be touching anything dead. It, it, it played over into the time of Jesus too. But, yep. but a Nazarite was was uh, specifically uh, commanded, "Don't touch anything that was dead. No mm -hmm. dead bodies." And finally, the Nazarite was to never cut his hair. And there, of course, there's nothing wrong with being. Uh, you know, getting your hair, hair getting haircut, kind of looking, styling like you want to. Um, but, and, but you know, I think uh, probably what we, you know, the, John the Baptist, like we said a minute ago, was he was also a Nazarite. And if we think about him, the kind of life that he lived, and uh -huh. compare he he lived what you would what if you were a Nazarite. What you, he remember he had he had he had. Uh, just wild animal clothing on. He lived mm -hmm. out in the wilderness. Didn't have any money. He ate locusts and honey. That's kind of what the that was what a true Nazarite uh, was. But now, let me ask you this: Do you think that Samson was someone that looked different than everybody else, um, and that's why people were perplexed at why he had so much strength? Or do you think that he was like a Hulk Hogan, where? He had muscles protruding everywhere. Probably one of the, uh, and I think it's from the indications, uh, some of the re inferences that you might get from the Bible. I think probably if you looked at Samson, he didn't look like Arnold Schwarzenegger. Yeah. You know, he probably looked like your average everyday uh, Israelite. Mm -hmm. So it was probably perplexing to the uh, Philistines why this man had so much strength that he did, why he could take a jawbone of an ass and kill a thousand people, why he could pick up uh, an, an entire gate of a city and carry it. Uh, some scholars say maybe it was as far as 30 or 40 miles mm -hmm. and set it down on top of a hill. And, you know, it, but, and I think probably what your, uh, my opinion of that would be that uh, was Samson was guy. probably, if you looked at him, you'd think, well, this is just an ordinary mm -hmm. Joe out here. Yeah. I didn't think there was anything particularly uh, about his physical appearance that would that would tell people that, hey, this has got to be a strong guy. Yeah, you ever see an Am Amish person, uh, they stick out a little oh, yeah. bit in society. Um, you, see, you see the hair, and, uh, and that's probably how Samson stuck out, just yeah. the fact that he had long hair, but yeah. there's nothing else about him mm -hmm. that would uh, cue you to, to yeah. you know, being the Nazarite I outside think that's just right. that right there. But he was certainly gifted by God. Oh, yeah. You know? And I think a lot of us... Um, learn early on, especially when we're in school, that we'll see people that have artistic skills, like you're talking about your mm -hmm. grandson being able to yeah. color. Oh, them. yeah. There's folks that have the artistic skill. There's those that that are musically talented, athletically talented. Some some people have leadership skills. Some have, a, you know, kind of intellectual skills yeah. or organizational skills. But here's the thing. All of us kind of come into life with a certain things that we do well but that doesn't make us better than anyone else. Oh, absolutely not. And, and that's kind of the problem that Samuel Samson got into yeah. is that 
is that while he was gifted by God, he, he kind of let that get in the way yeah. of how he saw himself and how he saw others. Yeah, you know? he let that pride, that pride right. thing start growing mm -hmm. with him. Um, if you follow me with the bi biography of, of Samson, you can see several common characteristics of a prideful person. In Judges 14, 1 through 3, we read this. And this is one example of, of uh, Samson's pride. Uh, Samson went, and this, and this is reading from Judges 14, 1 through 3. Samson went down to uh, Timnah and saw there a young Philistine woman. When he returned, he said to his father and his mother, I have seen a Philistine woman in Tim, uh, Timnah, now get her for me as my wife. His father and his mother replied, Isn't there an acceptable wo woman among your relatives or among all our people? Must you go to the uncircumcised Philistines to get a wife? But Samson said to his father, Get her for me. She's the right one for me. Okay, so mm. this is the you know the, the, the kind of pride that makes, uh, makes us feel like we're superior to other people. This is the... It's working here in this uh, in these passages that you just read. Um, he felt like he was too good for you know the women yeah. in his community, yep. and he asked his parents if uh, you know to to choose someone from the Phil Philistines. And so he was special, he thought, yep. but too special oh, you yeah. know for for those that, that that were around there. He wanted someone flasher. Uh, he didn't want to settle for anyone that was from Israel. And so a pride person always measures himself against other people. Um, people really aren't proud of being rich or athletic or smart or attractive. They're proud of being richer, more athletic, smarter, yeah. more attractive yeah. than uh, someone else. And so a proud person has a condescending spirit. Yeah. A proud person is always looking down on others. Um, yeah. I shouldn't have to stand in this line. Yeah. Or, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, I should be treated better than this. This that's, is kind of the attitude. That's right, George. And in Romans 12 and 16 makes this point. It says, Do not be proud, but willing to associate with people of low position. Do yeah. not be conceited. And man mm. was Samson ever the conceited individual. I mean, you, you look at everything he did, from the who he chose from his wife, who he chose to associate with. Samson very thought very highly of himself. And he felt because of the of his choice of wives, I think he, that even shows that he was he felt like he was too good even for his own peers, for yeah. his own for the own Israelite people. But you know what? God, I think, used this pride that he was too good for his own people to put him in a place where he would be with the Philistines because he even married into them to help uh, to put him in contact with the Philistines to help him begin, the Bible says, to begin to deliver the Israelites out of the hand of... If if if, if Samson had married a, uh, an Israelite, stayed over in his own territory, mm -hmm. probably the v vigilante that was in him would have, would have had less opportunity to make contact with the Philistines. So I think it was kind of God working in a little kind of a backwards way there yeah. to put, put Samson in a position where he would be in constant contact with the Philistines so he could constantly be a harassment to them so they'd be fighting Samson instead of oppressing the Israelites. It's okay. amazing to me how God kind of worked in that. He does way. that all the time, doesn't yeah, he? Yeah, absolutely. All right, secondly, uh, pride scoffs at traditional standards. Um, looking at Judges 14, we're still in Judges 14. Uh, you're following along, verse 5. Samson went down to Timnah together with his father and mother. As they approached the vineyards of Timnah, suddenly a young lion came roaring toward him. Toward him. The Spirit of the Lord came upon him in power, so that he tore the lion apart with his bare hands uh, as he might have torn a young goat. But he, t but he told neither his father nor his mother what he had done. And so, um, so why didn't he tell his mother and father? Because he was in the vineyard. What was he doing in the vineyard? Doing what he wasn't supposed to be doing, yep. eating grapes. Absolutely. You know, again, this is the, uh, uh, the Nazarite vow that, that James described a moment ago. Yep. Uh, prohibited uh, wine or, or grapes. And so we're going to see in the next couple of passages, he's just going to break one yeah. after the other. This is the first one that he breaks here yeah. it, by being in the vineyard eating grapes. And yeah. James, you want to read yeah, the Yeah, in uh, Judges 14, 8 through 9, we read, uh, the Bible says, Sometime later, when he went back to marry her, speaking of the Philistine woman, he turned aside to look at the lion's carcass, the lion's carcass that he had killed, and in it was a swarm of bees and some honey. Uh, he scooped, which he scooped out with his hands, 
and he ate as he went along. So here he is, he scooped out the honey and he's eating it as he's kind of getting along. And when he rejoined his parents, he gave them some. And they ate too, but he did not tell them what he had taken from the lion's carcass. Why did he not tell them where that honey had came from? Because he was a Nazarite and he was not supposed to be touching his dead body. So now the Nazarite vow had three things. You couldn't, you couldn't eat or drink wine, or, you couldn't eat grapes or eat wine. You couldn't touch anything dead. Bam, the first two are gone. The only thing left to him is his long hair now. Yeah. And that's going to play an important, crucial role here a little bit later. Um, so, but even though he, uh, you know, he was disregarding in all these that's things. Exactly right. His pride was causing him to disregard all the values that were imposed upon him, not only by his parents, but also by that Nazarite vow. He, mm -hmm. he, he scoffed at his parents and his duty to God through the Nazarite vow. It's kind yeah. of amazing. And it's often, you know, Pride does that a lot of times. Pride mm -hmm. often makes us scoff at old what what we would consider old values. I remember when I was 18 years old, I thought my dad was the dumbest person in the yep. in the world, and I and I hate to admit that, but I'll We've have to admit there, it bro. on television. Yeah, that I thought my dad. But when I later on, when I saw him uh, laying on his bed right before he passed away in the hospital. I looked at him and I thought, you know, there lays a man that I should have listened to a lot, a lot, a lot more than I ever than I did when I, when, we were, when, I, when I was growing up. Because even though there, there was times that I thought he was telling me things that was just wanting to wreck my fun, yeah, he was telling me things that in the long run oh, he was going to help. That's yeah. exactly right. And so. Okay, so moving on here, characteristics of a prideful person, pride flaunts his accomplishments, and we're going to be looking in, in Judges 16 now. And so we're making our way through these uh, three chapters here. And so beginning with verse 1, uh, one day Samson went to Gaza where he saw a prostitute. Should have been there probably. He went into he went in to spend the night with her. People of Gaza were, were told Samson is here. So they surrounded the place and lay in wait for him all night at the city gate. Uh, they made no move during the night, saying, at dawn, we'll kill him. But Samson lay there only until the middle of the night. He got up, took hold of the doors of the city gate, together with uh, two posts, and tore them loose. Bar and all, he lifted them to his shoulders and carried them to the top of the hill that faces Hebron. Oh, so, man. Tar uh, he was doing his Tarzan yell in this in this instant. I think he not only wanted to show that to show the Philistines how strong he wanted to show them in a very spectacular way. You know, he could have just fought his way out of there, but he decided I'm going to pick up and you and it's a there's. I've tried to get estimates on how much this gate must have weighed. It must have been humongous because it was. They said it was usually wood covered with metal, so this huh. thing had to have weighed an awesome amount and anyway he picked up the gates and everything in the middle of the night carried it out some people have estimated where this hill was it was probably uh 20 it may have been as far as 35 to 40 miles away and he left it on a hillside hmm. so not only did he carry it he carried it uphill and set it down and the next morning and it's amazing this uh in gaza was where this happened in gazer gaza i yeah. guess um it's amazing that his most spectacular feat of superhuman strength happened in the same city where they put his eyes out would later he would later meet his I don't want to tell the end of the yeah, story you get to the end already yeah I've already got, I've already told you the end that would that um, that's where he met his yeah. you know his final end mm -hmm. it's kind of but anyway if you've got intellectual strengths you don't need to flaunt those things you know, like getting into an argument with somebody because you know you, you're you're mental, yeah. mentally superior to them. Don't get into a, a, an argument with them just be, just so you can flaunt your intellectual strengths. Yeah. If you got wealth strengths, you know, don't flaunt your superiority. I've seen I've seen people that's got a lot of money that has a new toy every day and they like to parade it around in front of people. And some that have money that, that are yeah. unassuming and you never know. Ab you'll never know. You never know. Some of the richest people you know, are, uh, and I've known in my past, wore a pair of coveralls and in their bib they ne didn't like banks. 
And in their bib, they had more money than I would have ever accumulated in my <laughs> life. I mean, it's just amazing. If yeah. you've got physical strength, you know, like Samson did, yeah. you know, don't don't flaunt that. Don't don't bring attention to yourself. Um, if you've got educational strengths and you want to display your diplomas and titles in your room, that's okay. But you know, don't don't belittle other people. And you, and I see I, I've seen that a lot too, where you sure. you know people that think they're highly educated and they and just because they got a sheepskin on the wall, they think they're more important, they're more they're uh, more intelligent than the average Joe running around out here that just mm. maybe doesn't even have a high school education. But some That's of you right. smartest people, George, are people that's got common sense. That's right. And, and they don't necessarily have a sheepskin on the wall. Will Good points. Will Rogers once said um, this. He said, "We're all ignorant." but we're just all ignorant in different fields. And uh, Jesus said, uh, and this is a quote from Jesus, he said, now when you go to a banquet, don't take the chief seats. If you have an important position, don't demand titles. If you're praying and you're spiritual, don't do it out in the street corners where people will applaud you. Because he said, God has brought down rulers from their th thrones, but he lifts up the humble. Good point. Well, you know, the uh, Paul Faulkner, um, he was at ACU for many, many years and, you know, he had a, he had a doctorate Yeah. and, you know, he, when I sat in on his couple of, a couple of his classes and he would say, you know, having, having a doctorate, being a PhD is, you know, you do all this research on a certain, certain field of study and you know it very well, you know, and it's, it's good research, but, um, Time has a way of just outdating everything that you know. And, oh, yeah. and uh, so, so I knew it for, I knew this information really well during this period, but you know, um, over a period of time, that all becomes like there's there's more information. And and so, yeah, we're all ignorant in some, in some areas. And maybe I knew some things in one area for a period of time doesn't make me the you know, the, the person that knows everything about all things. Yeah, you know? absolutely. Another thing he says here, um, characteristics of a prideful person is pride always overestimates its ability to cope with evil. And this is the this is the downfall here. Beginning with verse 6, we're in chapter 16, uh, beginning with verse 4. Uh, sometime later, he fell in love with a woman in the valley of Sorek, whose name was Delilah. The rulers of the Philistines went to her and said, uh, see if you can lure him into showing you the secret of his great strength and how we can overpower him so we may tie him up and subdue, subdue him. Each one of us will give you 1,100 shekels of silver. I know you looked that up, didn't you? No, you did. I did not. You did. <laughs> but it's like 20, 28 pounds of silver yeah. is uh, each, each, if you can just determine yeah. what, what his weakness is. Yeah. What his weakness is there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's that's pretty. And now we come to the most familiar part. Everybody, this is the one. This is the one where the most. If you're watching the movie on Samson, this is the climax. This is the most important mm -hmm. part. Everything kind of leads into this. Um, it's where Delilah uh, coaxes out of Samson. You know, how do you? Where do you get your great strength from? So these. So the Philistines have come to her and said, hey, we'll give you, each one of us is going to give you a bunch of silver. And I don't know how much that silver's worth, but we'll each one give you a bunch of silver if you'll find out from Samson how he, where in the world he gets all that strength from. Yeah. And so first time she, she gets Samson in there and she says, Samson, if you love me, show me the secret of your strength. And then Samson says, well, uh, and he lies to her the first time. He says, uh, well, I'll tell you what, if I were tied up with seven leather straps on my, on my arms, I'd be weak as a kitten. And so that's what she did. She put him to sleep. You know, he fell asleep. She put those seven leather, she got seven leather straps, put him on him. And then she said, hey, Samson, here's the Philistines. They're about to get you. And he, he wakes up and he breaks those leather straps, you know, just like they weren't anything. And then he pounds on the Philistines. The second time, and prob a lot of people, and I did too, wondered why uh, Samson would would come back every time and was he playing games here. Yeah, was I think he was playing games with Delilah, and also this wasn't happening probably just one night and then the next night. This was probably happening over a period of time. I think that's probably what was going on. Anyway, so 
next time, second time, she get, she coaxes him, gets him in there, gets him in the lovey-dovey, you know, they're all mm -hmm. snuggled up on the couch uh, type thing and says, Samson, you made a fool out of me the last time. What? Tell me, please, what's the secret of your strength? And so uh, he's, and then, you know, Samson's, he's, he's still playing along. And uh, he says, well, what you'll do, he said, if you'll tie me up with seven new ropes, new ropes, mm -hmm. I'll be as weak as any other man in the Philistines and they can come do whatever they want to with him. So Delilah puts him to sleep on the couch. She ties him up with the seven new ropes. Here comes in the Philistines, same scenario. He busts the ropes just like they weren't anything and he pounds on the Philistines again. Third time, same situation. They're all snuggled up on the couch. She says, Samson, now you've lied to me already twice. If you love me, please tell me how, how what I can, what, what, where your strength is. And he says, well, let's see. Um, if you will he's weave. Getting, he's getting close now. He's getting close. That's exactly right, George. Yeah, he's, he's playing around. He's, he's getting to the Yeah, hair. he's getting uncomfortably close to the edge of what really is his strength. Okay. And he says, if you weave the seven bra braids of my hair into the fabric of the loom and tighten it with a pin, I'll become weak as another man, and and uh, then I, then the Philistines can have their way with me. And then, of course, that's what she does. Again, the Philistines come in. Again, Samson, <laughs> to the shock of amazement to everybody, he just busts out of the loom and uh, kills the Philistines. And then finally, she's on him day and night. Finally, she says... Uh, she says this to him, and I'll just read from Judges 15 through, 15 through 17. Then she said to him, How can you say, I love you, when you won't confide in me? This is now the third time that you've made a fool of me, and you haven't told me the, the secret of your great strength. And then with such nagging, she prodded him day after day until Samson was just tired to death. So he broke down and he told her everything. No razor has ever been used on my head because I've been a Nazarite set apart to God from birth. If my head were shaved, my strength would leave me and I would become weak as other men. And, and remember, mm -hmm. he'd already broken the other two Nazarite vows. This is the only one left to him, his hair. And he's finally give up that secret. And so he just kind of says, I don't need God. Yeah. This is what his way, you know, this is... This is basically what he's communicating. That's here. exactly and, right. And so um, Samson was uh, humiliated by his enemies. While Samson slept, the lila cut his hair. Yep. And, um, and then she called out, Samson, the Philistines are upon you. And the Bible says he woke from his sleep and thought, well, I'll just go out and shake myself free like you did before. And it ends oh, up a little bit differently. It, oh, well, yeah. Situation this time, he finally, his Nazarite vow was completely broken. God left him. The Philistines, this time, they were able to subdue him. They take him out, and like I said a few minutes ago, this happened, and they, they put him, they put out his eyes. Uh, they said they gouged out his eyes. I think the Hebrew term uh, kind of refers to that they may have used a red-hot poker mm -hmm. just to kind of push into his eyes and, and blind him. Um, then they take Samson, they put him in a grind house, to grind, to, uh, in, in, a, in a prison grinding, and that was, grinding was um, left to the very lowest slaves at that time. That was a very humiliating position. Uh, putting out the eyes was humiliating. If you'll remember a lot, there's a lot of references in the, in, the New, in the Old Testament where when a king was captured, they would blind him. It was a way to humiliate him. Yeah. They, put, they placed him in it, and it says bronze fetters, bronze chains, shackles. Mm -hmm. They used shackles because bronze was, was uh, actually a, uh, not as strong as iron, so it was a way to say, hey, Hey Samson, you ain't as strong as you used to be. We won't even use our good chains on you. Yeah. So they they anyway they took him there. So he's in a, he's in this position here, and something starts to happen. Yeah. He can't see it. No, obviously he can't see it. But if you, if he he started to feel something yeah. growing. His hair starts going back. He's in the grindhouse. Yeah. He's been there for a long time, and his hair starts growing back. Yeah. And the Philistines. This has been a, probably over a, a while, 
several weeks probably. And the Philistines, all the re, all the Philistine leaders decide they're going to throw a big party, About a big bash. Of them. Yeah, at least that many. And they all gather in the in the temple of their god, Dagon, their god. Mm -hmm. And they come in there, and they and they're they're throwing their little rowdy party, their little drunken uh, party. And uh, at some point they say, hey, let's, why don't we bring out Samson so we can kind of make sport of him, let him entertain, entertain us a little us, bit. Yeah, yeah let, him, you know, let him entertain us. And uh, so they bring out Samson. I can just hear him saying, hey, here's the guy that our god, Dagon, uh, brought down, uh, who defeated, and here he is. Here's the guy, the great, the great Samson that was so, that was just pounding us at one time. And now he's, you know, he's nothing. We got him here and we got him shackled. And so they actually uh, put Samson out there in the middle of the ring and made him entertain. I'm not sure what he probably did. Hmm. They were probably throwing insults at him, and the, you know who knows what they were making Samson yep. do. Uh, but anyway, Samson. After they got through with him, uh, Samson said he 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 was he asked the, the little boy that was with him. He said, "Take me over to the main pillars of this of the temple, this Dagon temple that they were, all these people." And the religion and their and the Phil Philistine uh, leaders were in, and so I can rest myself. And so, uh, the way those temples were back then, and they found ruins of these. Uh, ar archaeologists have the whole support system it was supported by two main pillars in the middle of the thing, and there's a big portico on the top, and down at the bottom, um, it, the the top covered of uh, the bench, the seating in, at the at, at, down at the bottom. And the religious, the Philistine uh, leaders were down at the bottom and then all the other people were kind of up on the portico at the top. Anyway, Samson, the, the, it was all supported by these two main uh, pillars. pillars. Mm -hmm. And Samson asked the little boy, he said, put me over there by those, and he knew what he was going to do when he did it. And he said, and Samson said, um, when he when he got over there, he grasped those pillars, and some people think he pushed them out this way. He probably actually pushed them this way, <laughs> away from him on each side, because it said he grasped them. So okay. he pushed with all his might, and he and he and when he did that, the roof came down. It killed all the people that was up on top of the portico, up on the balcony, as you might call it, and it killed. Obviously, it killed all the all the leaders, and it says that he killed more at during that time, at that time, dying that he ever then he killed in in his mm -hmm. entire life. Yeah. So here's that a, was here's how it reads amazing. here, twenty seven to thirty. We got to wrap up. Yeah. Now, the temple was crowded with men and women. All the rulers of the Philistines were there, and on the roof uh, were about three thousand men and women watching Samson perform whatever he was doing. Yeah. And Samson prayed to the Lord, O Sovereign Lord, remember me, O God, please strengthen me just once more. And let me with one blow get revenge on the Philistines for my two eyes. Then Samson reached toward the two center central pillars on which the temple stood, bracing himself against them, his right hand on the one and his left hand on the other. Samson said, let me die with the Philistines. And then he pushed with all his might and he came down and down came the temple on the rulers and the people in it. Thus he killed many more when he died when he lived. Yep. And that is the uh, that's the end of Samson. Yep. But uh, he fell, but he seems to be falling forward at the end. You know, yeah. it's like he's he's falling, but um, he is his hair grows back, and he is uh, um, seems like he's connecting to God. Yeah. Like need I like I need you, Lord. And there was and a the, different Samson in that grind. At the very end, there, yeah. There's a there's a dis different Samson and. I think we were talking about how that the only time that Samson prays to God in this whole narrative is yeah. at the end the very when end. he calls out to God for strength to, to be able to uh, kill the Philistines. Uh, some yeah. takeaways. I have a couple, and I know you have I've a couple one. as well. Yep. Yeah. So um, one is that you and I can, uh, we can choose our sin, but we can't choose our consequences. I mean, we can choose a sin that we want to commit. But uh, we have no idea what, the, what those consequences might be. And, you know, for him, uh, it seems like Samson was very playful at the very end there with Delilah. But uh, throughout this whole story, he seems to have a problem with his, with his eyes and uh, toward women, especially a prostitute. Um, and here with Delilah, I don't think he was um, um, seeing Delilah as a long-term commitment 
probably more of a fling than anything, yeah. but uh, you know, in, in the end, his eyes are gouged out. Like yeah. it's like, you know, the very thing that, that is giving him the problem or his eyes are the very thing that they're, they're gouged out. We can choose our sin, but we can't choose the consequence yeah. of our sin. Absolutely. You know, maybe one takeaway. Absolutely. Um, I also think that sin weakens, never strengthens. And um, I think that uh, sometimes we get a little bit too, um, I don't know, where we just sort of, you know, we we applaud the fact that, you know, we've made mistakes and, you know, we're better as a result of it. The bottom line is we're never strengthened by sin. You know, we're, we're blinded by sin. We're bound by sin. Um, it very rarely does anything would kill us, yeah. you know, we're, we, we need to look at sin, take sin seriously. Um, it is what kills and destroys, nothing really good about it. Okay. Well, probably the, out, of the, out of this whole book and, and specifically with Samson, one of the great takeaways I got was that Samson, he had the potential to be a really important individual for Israel and for God. But he didn't use those abilities like he should have. Mm -hmm. um, we can have, as individuals, we can have talents and we can have abilities, uh, but we'll never be able to fully utilize those talents and those abilities unless we exercise discipline, unless we exercise a moral compass in our life. Uh, we, can have, we can be the smartest person on earth. We can be the richest person on earth. We can be like Samson, the, the strongest person that ever lived on the earth. But unless we have a moral compass, unless we have discipline in our lives, unless we have God in our lives and we're following what He wants us to do, we'll never achieve our greatest potential. Mm. That's a good point. Good takeaway. One final takeaway that I have, maybe you have one more, is that uh, you never fall outside of the reach of God. And this is, uh, I think, one of the takeaways that I see when I... Look at the story of Sam, Samson. You know he's um, he's fallen mightily, yeah. and uh, yet uh, there in that prison, his hair grows back, and he, you know, once again um, remembers the things that that gave him strength. Staying away from graves, staying away from dead bodies, long hair. Those are all important when it comes to the Nazarite vow. But understanding that what you and I have, if we're gifted. It's a gift of God. Yeah, you know, if you have a, if you have a gift, if you're able to do something well, and for him it was strength, um, acknowledging that it's God that is the one that gave that gave us that. God is the one that gave him that gift. God is the one that gives us yeah. the gifts that we have, and to acknowledge that. And he does it at the end. He asks. He's praying to God, yeah. and God is listening to him. And yeah. so God's not far. Yeah. Um, I, I've got reach. one more, and I'll, I'll close. I'll be quiet. God can use. You know. Samson wasn't the, you know, the kind of individual that you'd think would anybody could use. But God used Samson as a vehicle to do his will and to, to do what needed to have been done. And I think God can even use COVID. There's been good things. As bad as it is, I think God can use things like COVID. God can use things like wildfires. God can even use things like murder hornets to do his will. Uh, you're not going to be able to, in, in this life, you're not going to, God, you're not going to be able to stop what God wants done. Yeah. You know, you don't have to do His will, but somehow or another, God, if, even if He has to work around you, God is going to do, His will is going to be done. Amen. That's a good way to wrap it all up. The story, um, the story of Samson and also the book of Judges. And we want to thank everybody for tuning in, and we'll be announcing um, we'll be announcing later on in a couple of days what we'll be doing in our next series. And we thank you for joining us in the study of uh, of these judges. And uh, we we'll wrap up with a word of prayer. Okay, so let's pray together. Father, we're so grateful uh, for this midweek Bible study to be able to come together again. Just open up your Word and and read it and talk about it. Thank you for my partner James here, who's done a lot of studying through the Book of the Judges and just brought some, some insight in, uh, into these stories that has been helpful to us all. Father, as you look at the last judge tonight, I pray that you'll help us um, to see the, the consequences of our pride. Every one of us struggles with pride. It's not something that's unique to, to one or two of us, but all of us. And so uh, we pray that um, you will uh, point it out to us where we can see it. Father, help us to, to acknowledge it. Uh, we pray, Father, for more humility in dealing with others, um, that uh, 
we may not see ourselves as more important, but uh, uh, to see ourselves equal um, with, uh, with others, and especially those that um, we don't see eye to eye with. Help us, Father, to have, um, ha have that grace, uh, to extend that grace, and know that uh, they're created um, in your image as well. And uh, Father, so I just pray for, for all of us that uh, we might just uh, take sin more seriously in our lives and uh, because there are serious consequences. And I, I pray, Father, that uh, we'll just uh, um, work hard at just being more obedient to what you say. It saves us all, all, all of us a lot of heartache. And we know you give us, uh, um, you give us your word to, to light a path, Father, that would to make our lives more uh, fruitful and, and more pleasing to you. And uh, Father, I uh, just pray, Father, that um, you would um, uh, be close to us all because we're all Samson. We're all prideful and we all are in need of, um, uh, of your power and strength. And Father, as we think of uh, the things that we're good at, we pray that we might use those good gifts um, in the right way and, and never use those gifts uh, to, to make others feel less. But to make them feel like, like they're important as well. Uh, again, Father, we pray for our church family. We know that there are many right now in the middle of this week that are enduring the, uh, the hurricane that's coming, um, that's probably arrived already in, in our area, and just pray for um, all those that might be in the path. We pray, Father, for, for safety. We pray, Father, for all those that are sick in our congregation. We pray for our community, um, our children who are in school, and uh, um, are off on this uh, Wednesday, but as they prepare for uh, Thursday, I pray that um, uh, you would be with all these families and these parents that um, they might just lean on you and uh, to help them through this uh, difficult season. Watch over us all is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.